everyone. Thank you so much for coming. It's great. We, our group just grows and grows. It's wonderful. Um, and we have some forms over there for you to fill out about what you're interested in. And it may capture how you've heard about us, but that's always of interest to us. So please tell friends. My name is Patrice Keat, and I am one of the founders and the executive director of the Santa Cruz Children's Museum of Discovery in the Capitola Mall. We're in the former Abercrombie and Fitch store near the food court. And it's a great place for zero to about eight years old. Uh, tons of exhibits and classes and all. So if you have little ones in your world, bring them. We have memberships and all. And um, just our, it's our name, uh, www. Uh, FCCMOD.org and you can find out a lot more about us. But we've been in conjunction with the Santa Cruz Public Library putting on our Citizen Science series every Thursday of the first Thursday of the month for we think five years. So lots of wonderful ideas and brain power has been in this room both in the audience and with our speakers and we're glad to have you here tonight. Uh, we're particularly interested in what else you would like to hear about because we are always gathering ideas. Um, I'd like to introduce our, our uh, speaker tonight, distinguished professor in chemistry and biochemistry, Glenn Milhauser from UCSC, and a very interesting topic. Uh, and Glenn is going to tell you more about himself. Okay. And there's a designated might introduce us, cookies and tea. Do you have a pointer by any chance? If not, that's okay. I can just use my, my I analog. Do you have a pointer? A pointer? No. All right. Want, We're uh, using analog. This one pen is the best. We can use a laser. I think it's. Oh, work. great. Um, maybe yeah, that would do the trick. Thank you. Don't take it away. It's one of the best. Olaf wants to rent it to me. Let's see. We can see if it works. Which you can always count on the librarians in the <laughs> audience. Well, oh, there it is. Oh, okay, there we go. Well, it kind of works. Oh, it's funny. It doesn't show up on the screen. All right. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, so we're, we're back to the analog. Um, uh, thank you, Patrice. So it's funny. When uh, Patrice emailed, what, two weeks ago, three oh, weeks ago? It wasn't ago? long. It wasn't <laughs> long. And asked if I would uh, be a speaker. And so I also arrange a, uh, not every month, but I arrange a speaker group at the uh, Temple Bethel Synagogue. And it's always so stressful finding speakers. And so when you email, I knew it would be a relief if I just said yes in a very uncomplicated, you know, I'll, I'll meet your date. Yeah. So Patrice wants me to say something about myself. So what I'll say is um, I've been teaching at UC Santa Cruz for <coughs> 30 years. Mm -hmm. Olaf. So Olaf is my, <laughs> she's been here one year less than me, uh, my colleague Olaf Einer's daughter. Um, I teach uh, beginning chemistry. So, by the way, I'm, I'm used to projecting in a large crowd. Right now I'm teaching a class of 350 students. Uh, but, but let me just do a sound check. Can everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. All right, coming across all right, great. So, um, what else? Um, I, my research is in biophysical chemistry. Um, we've been working in this field for many, many years. And, uh, you know, there's things on the CV, but it's really not all. We won't take time for that. Okay. So um, anyhow, it's a pleasure to be here and to see uh, friends, uh, Shirley, Dave, and, and Olaf. And, and, and you know, it's funny, when Patrice uh, said this is the Santa Cruz Children's Museum, I thought there'd be kids in the audience, you know? But I guess, you know, we're, we're the young at heart, right? Okay, okay, there's a kid right there. Yes. Yeah. Going 60. Yeah, yeah. When, when are you finishing high school? <laughs> I only got the GED. Hey, me too. Yes. All right, anyhow. So there's my title for the day. And so what I'm going to talk about uh, is a uh, very general talk, not super sciencey. I'd like to give you more background and give you a sense of what, what motivates us and um, uh, the history that, that comes to this field and the implications nowadays. And also give you a sense of how science works. Um, a lot of folks, you know, a lot of scientists, we science will get up and we'll talk about just the science. But there's so much around it in terms of who does the science? Who funds the science? The, you know, and all the intricacies. And I find that people are often very interested in that. So I'm going to talk about a mystery, uh, then a story. I'll talk about proteins and neurodegeneration, um, something that's very, very important in today's med medical culture. Um, some new instruments we have up at UCSC. I'll touch, touch on just a little bit about the work that my lab does. And then we'll talk more about the generalities of uh, how research is done nowadays. So here's the mystery. 
So, um, and I hope you, uh, you know, Santa Cruz can be, um, have a lot of very strong opinions, you know, among folks. Uh, but I'll be blunt with you, the reality is animals are used in research, um, especially laboratory animals, rats, mice, and so forth. And so I'm going to explain an experiment. This, this is an experiment that's been going on in multiple laboratories for about 20, 25 years now. And it's really <laughs> a, a bizarre curiosity, okay? So uh, when you discover a protein, a new protein, and you want to know what that protein does, one of the first things you do is you generate a laboratory animal that lacks the protein. That's called a knockout, okay? And, and then you can tell by any derangements you see in that animal what that protein may have been responsible for. Very, very important. So the protein I'm going to introduce you to is called PRP, and that stands for prion protein, and I'll show you lots of its little molecular architecture um, a little bit later in the talk. But suffice to say, we'll just think of a protein. Proteins, at one level, are very, very simple. They're, they're strings of amino acids, and they, they bunch up and they take on different structures. Our genome encodes for anywhere, depending on how you want to count from 10 to 20,000 different types of proteins. Everything we do is mediated by different types of proteins. The fact that you can see me is because you have rhodopsin in your retina, okay, and that's absorbing photons of light, particles of light, and transmitting that into a neurological signal. Um, if you've had some cookies, you have digestive enzymes that are working on those, and those are proteins. Um, the fact that I'm moving up here, those are muscle proteins. So proteins carry out everything. And so uh, the prion protein is just one of, you know, these many, many thousands of proteins. So when you have the full complement, little circles are meant to represent amino acids. When you have the full complement, prion protein isn't terribly large, it's about 200 amino acids. That's kind of moderate size in the general scale. Wild type animal's totally fine, of course. Okay, it has its prion protein. If you eliminate the N-terminal half, so proteins have a name. There's this N-terminal side and the C-terminal side. It's just kind of like you number from N to C. So if you eliminate all the amino acids on the, the N-terminal half of the protein, that animal's completely fine. If you eliminate the entire protein, that animal's fine. But here's what's weird. If you knock out just a few amino acids out of the middle, here's my little diagram showing that, that animal does not survive. And in fact, just 20 amino acids. So think of this. So you've got 10, 20,000 different proteins in the body. You take one fairly small protein that doesn't seem to be particularly important, okay? You knock 20 amino acids out of the middle of that protein and those animals do not survive. How can that be? And to this day, this is really not totally understood, but I'll give you just a little bit of insight in, in, in terms of how we're thinking about it as we get a little bit later. So that's the mystery. Now, along with this, let me show you just a little bit more. This is actually one of those animals that has that, that knockout region, that, that uh, uh, central region eliminated. So CD, so this is protein <coughs> nomenclature, TG means transgenic animal. This is an animal that had, had its prion gene modified to eliminate those middle 20 amino acids. The delta means it's missing, and CD just means central domain. So those 20 amino acids are missing. So what I'm going to show you is a little video. This is, comes from a lab in Zurich where they basically study these animals, look at their tissues and so forth. And what you'll see is that this animal is suffering a terrible neurodegenerative syndrome. And it very much parallels the kind of thing that would happen if the animal were suffering something like we would think of nowadays of an advanced form of Alzheimer's disease or as a disease I'll introduce you to fairly shortly called creutzfeldt jakob disease. So this animal is actually a neonate. It wasn't born all that long before this film was taken. And you can see it's having a very, very difficult time walking. It falls over. Um, it has a hard time grasping and so forth. And again, just from this elimination of 20 amino acids in the middle of that, that one single type of protein. Very, very dramatic. All right, so that's the mystery. So that's something we'll come back to. So the story I want to tell you goes back now 70, 80 years ago to a region of the world, Papua New Guinea, right over here. And um, there are tribal people living in the highland regions, up remote from any, any regions where there's a lot of civilization. And these people are called the 4A people. And there's a number of different tribes. And to this day, they're still very primitive. They, they carry on their customs as they, as they always have. But back then, back in the uh, 1940s, 1950s, they were suffering from a terrible disease called Kuru. And Kuru, in their language, means to shake. And so what the way Kuru would develop is the, the sufferer would begin by having a difficult time walking. Eventually they would start to shake. Um, their facial <coughs> muscles would pull back. It was often referred to, and they would chatter. Uh, the Australians, because of the geographical location, this is very well known in Australia, the Australians re would refer to this as the laughing death. 
And eventually, um, they had a hard time eating, breathing, they suffered cognitive uh, dysfunction, and eventually they would die. And so this disease was spreading among the 4A tribes, and uh, it was affecting primarily uh, women and children. Now, a facet of 4A life back then is that they were cannibals, okay? And this is very much a part of their culture, so why were they cannibals? Well, they believed that, the, 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 in terms of the afterlife, they were strong believers in the afterlife, and they felt that the more rapidly a body was consumed, the more rapidly the soul would go into the afterlife. And part of the reasoning is that if you, if you, you know, the blunt, if you bury a body, it's consumed by worms. If you leave a body out, it's consumed by maggots. So they felt that, that as an act of love, if they consumed the body, okay, carry out what's called a mortuary feast, consume the body, you would accelerate the, 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 um, the passage of the soul into the afterlife. So this was actually an act of love. And, uh, you know, it's, it's you know, uh, the people that, that have come close to the 4 people don't like to refer to it as cannibalism. It's more of a rite, a ritual. But nevertheless, that's what it was. Uh, because of the way the ritual was carried out, it was uh, the, the, the preparation of the tissues and the consumption was mainly done by women and, event and occasionally they would uh, pass on, you know, some of the food to the children. So it made sense that there was something transmissible in there that was causing kuru. So they're cannibals, they're eating these, this, these, this tissue, and people are getting sick and suffering from this horrible disease. So a couple of remarkable individuals, one of whom is still alive, Michael Alpers down there in the lower left, Carlton Geideshek, who died probably about 10 years ago, both went and lived among the 4A people. And uh, they studied them, and, and it really wasn't clear, even though now we, we totally easily make the connection between cannibalism and the passage of this, this material, um, that was not clear at all. They, they understood the disease, but they didn't realize, they didn't really make the connection. They weren't even completely aware that cannibalism was taking place. But they studied uh, the 4A people, and when, they, uh, when individuals um, would die of Kuru, they would carry out um, autopsy, and they would collect tissue, and bring it back to, um, to different laboratories and, and carry out experiments by injecting, for instance, infected tissue into chimpan chimpanzees and so forth to try to evolve and eventually see whether this was an infectious type of disease. So here's a couple of uh, uh, slices from brain tissue. And of course, one of the things you expect is when you're dealing with an infectious disease, so the disease is being passed along as we now understand through, understand through cannibalism, and when you've got something that's infectious, what do we always think of in modern society? We think of either a virus or a bacterium, right? Those are the things. You get a cold virus, you, you, have, you have a secondary infection, it's a bacterium. These are the things that transmit diseases. So they would take the brain tissue, they would culture, put it in every medium they thought that they could possibly imagine that would allow them to culture the virus or the bacteria and nothing ever grew, okay? So there was nothing there. On the other hand, there were a couple of interesting features. One that's really clear when you compare these two, okay? Over here, healthy brain tissue, over here, you see all these little void spots? These are vacuoles, okay? This vacuolization, this spongy appearance of the brain is very, very common in, uh, in Kuru sufferers uh, post-mortem. So there is something going on. So it's, these diseases are now referred to as the TSEs, the transmissible infectious spongiform encephalopathies. But this has now led to a totally different way of thinking of certain types of infectious diseases, and this is, this is what we'll get into. So, um, right. So Kuru, fortunately, barely exists anymore. And a matter of fact, one could probably make a case that it doesn't exist anymore. Um, missionaries went and lived among the 4A people, and of course, Alpers, Kaidashek, others, um, really tried to, you know, put, you know, push down the practice of cannibalism. So the 4A people apparently don't practice this anymore. But these diseases, these transmissible spongiform encephalopathies still exist. So first of all, among humans in the U.S., about one out of every 6,000 deaths is from this, okay? Uh, they also exist among animals, which is a good thing and a bad thing, okay? It's, of course, a bad thing because it, it creates somewhat of a threat. We'll touch on that in a second. But it's a good thing because one of the things that's really tough to do in biomedicine is to develop an animal model of a human disease. Well, here we already have a natural model, okay, because of the animals uh, that, that naturally get this. So there's scraping goats and sheep. This is very, very well regulated in the United States. Uh, the uh, uh, Department of Agriculture is very careful about allowing sheep, goats, et cetera, uh, in, the, in the United States that are possibly from infected regions. So we don't have much of that, if any, in the United States. On the other hand, somebody passed along the, an article. So who was that that, that 
Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So that's chronic wasting disease. And this is a huge problem in the United States, especially in the Rocky Mountain states and up through the Rockies in, in Canada. And in fact, in Canada, they have institutes that are devoted to studying this. So about 20 to 30 percent of all deer and elk in the wild have what's called chronic wasting disease. It's the same kind of disease as Kuru. It involves the same protein, the same progression. And interestingly, though, it spreads laterally among these animals. So you can actually, of course, these animals aren't cannibals, right? So you can eliminate all the sick animals, you can take all the healthy animals, put them into a new region, a new forested region, where the disease doesn't exist, let them go for several years, several generations, take those healthy animals, okay, reintroduce them back to where there was CWD, they start getting the disease again, okay? So the infectious material that's causing the disease is somehow, uh, you know, living in the environment. Something that probably everybody here has heard of, mad cow disease. This was a horrible issue, especially in the United Kingdom. And every time there's a single case of mad cow disease in the United States or in Canada, um, it hits all the, the newspapers. And I always love how whenever there is a case in the United States, we instantly try to find where that cow come from, come, came from so we can blame another country, right? <laughs> and uh, oftentimes it's Canada. Um, but anyhow, so mad cow disease was uh, a horrible plague. Uh, in the United Kingdom, this was in the late 1980s and early 1990s, led to the necessary slaughter of thousands and thousands of animals. I think upwards of 400,000 animals had to be slaughtered. Now, you think about this, okay? So we understand this infectious material is being propagated by cannibalism. Cows are herbivores, okay? How are they, you know, developing this, this disease that's normally associated with cannibals? Slaughterhouse practices. So you cannot have tissue left over. We don't buy everything that comes out of a cow for those of us that are, that are meat eaters. Okay, there's neural tissue left over, there's bone tissue left over, and so forth. Slaughterhouses cannot let any of this material accumulate, okay? Otherwise, they're gonna have mountains of it in, in no time. So what do they do? They grind it up and they put it into cow feed, okay? And so they were forcing the cows to be cannibals. And so it probably took just one or two cows to develop this infectious disease, and then that material was spread. And there's a number of cases we were talking uh, earlier. There's cases where in surgical procedures, similar things are spread to humans through corneal transplants, duramater transplants, and so forth. So anyhow, fortunately now, all those sick animals are now out of the system. The sad part is, um, because it is an infectious disease and infects numerous species, a question that always comes up, can it cross the species barrier? And yes, it can. And so far, about uh, 140, 150 individuals, humans in the United Kingdom, have developed mad cow disease, but the human version, the human version is referred to as creutzfeldt jakob disease, or CJD. So uh, this is a, a person over here who passed away many, many years ago from this uh, uh, in the 1990s. But these, some of the individuals that got this um, were as young as their late teens, if you can imagine. So as de devastating as something that, like Alzheimer's disease is, can you imagine somebody getting that in their, you know, when they're 19, 20 years old? I mean, it's absolutely horrible. Um, so Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is the most common human version of these diseases. So they're all related to each other. So you, have, you know, chronic wasting disease, scraping, mad cow disease, we have Kuru. But the most common form in Western society is called Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, um, CJD. About 85%, you can see the statistics up there are sporadic, and sporadic means there's, there's no uh, known origin, it just happens, okay? And, and interestingly, it's similar with Alzheimer's disease. Most cases don't have a genetic predisposition. About 14, 15% are inherited. Uh, these are from families that carry a certain mutation in that PRP protein that I was mentioning before, and the, their clock is ticking. If they just have one copy from one parent, they will get the disease. Penetrance is, so-called penetrance is very, very high. And I've met a number of these individuals, I know one. Uh, I know an individual who's in her early 30s, and she carries, um, I think it's the, uh, the D178N. It's a well-known mutation, and so she will develop either CJD or a related disease called fatal familial insomnia. And so she, and actually it's a very interesting side story, she is a lawyer, and her husband is a computer programmer, and when they found out that she was carrying this mutation, they both dropped their, uh, their careers, and they both became scientists. They have no formal training in science whatsoever, but they're both working at Harvard like crazy trying to find the cure for this disease, and they're, they're absolutely wonderful people. So this is the disease, all right. So now, protein plaque. So what this disease is coming from, and I'll give you a little um, sense of how this is propagated. This is not propagated by anything with a genome. So we think about 
about virus or bacteria, what links those things is that, in a sense, they're organisms. They have genes, okay? Viruses need our cells to replicate, but, but that's kind of a subtlety, okay? The fact is they have DNA or RNA as a gene, okay? These diseases propagate without, oh, that's my stupid phone. These diseases propagate without any uh, genetic component to the infectious particle. So what it's coming from is actually a protein. Okay, so there's a protein that clumps up and that protein can propagate. So on the left you see a plaque. This is, this is a so-called florid plaque. So I don't know if you guys can see it, but that little bit right in there, okay? It kind of looks like a little flower spreading out, all right? So that's a florid plaque and that's very, very typical of what's called variant creutzfeldt jakob disease. And this is the type of uh, disease that individuals that ate tainted mad cow tissue and develop the early form variant creutzfeldt jakob disease, that's the kind of plaque they get in the brain. So you can see a plaque over here, you can see a plaque over here, but there's something different about those plaques. Those plaques are, this one's from Alzheimer's disease, and this one's from Parkinson's disease. Yeah, question? Um, can you get that from a cavity? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, it's, it's a good question. There's been concerns about the idea of whether contaminated instruments, for instance, so if an instrument is used on a CJD patient, okay, or somebody has CJD, but they're pre-symptomatic, can any of that tissue be spread to, to another individual? There was some news about this a number of years ago, and I think it turned out to be negative, but I would have to go back and check, but it's an interesting point. Yeah, yeah. So anyhow, so these are you know different diseases, but they're all related to each other. All these diseases arise because we, we accumulate proteins. And I'll just say Shirley is sitting right over there, and her husband, uh, Tony Fink, many years ago, was a very noted researcher in the area of Parkinson's disease and told us, taught us a lot about how the particular protein involved there uh, uh, damages neurons, accumulates and damages neurons. So anyhow, so the protein plaques are a very, very different type of lesion in the brain that causes disease. So what's happening here, and this is just showing a little bit more molecular detail, these plaques often come from what's called amyloid deposits, which is kind of a funny name. Um, amyloid nowadays means that we develop these, these protein fibers, okay? So the, this is a scanning tunneling micrograph, that's an electron micrograph over there. But what's happening is that proteins are somehow assembling and forming these long fibers, and then these long fibers do damage the, the, to the surrounding tissue. So the, the name amyloid is kind of curious because to a chemist, A-M-Y-L, amyl, okay, refers to a sugar, okay? So why would we call this sugar-like? It's actually protein-like. Well, back in the early days when Alzheimer himself was first doing these studies, they found and they extracted these, these materials out of brains, and this was back around the year 1900, before we had any sense of the molecular detail, they found so-called birefringent properties that reminded them of sugars, okay? So they thought what that was depositing in the brain initially was a sugar-like material, but we now know that it's protein. Okay, so Alzheimer's disease. This is one of the great challenges of, of modern medicine. Um, and I'll talk more about this a little bit later, but just to put some, some numbers to it. And I think most of us are familiar with a lot of this and how devastating the disease is. But right now there's about five million cases in the United States. Um, it's six leading cause of, cause of death. Um, one third of all individuals over the age of 80 um, develop Alzheimer's disease. And you know, our lifespans, and this is one of the things that motivates us in the laboratory, our lifespans are getting longer and longer, which is a good thing. But if such a huge number of us are going to be demented, okay, as we get into those, you know, those later years, you start questioning whether we should be, you know, expanding life. We have got to figure out how to, how to deal with this, okay? The cost is also absolutely enormous. Right now, we're spending just in medical care about a quarter of a trillion dollars a year. But as many of you know, when a family member is you know, suffering from Alzheimer's disease, it's very expensive to get full-time medical care. And so what often happens is a family member will quit their job, okay? That's lost, you know, that's a lost contribution to our economy. And that loss adds up to another quarter of a trillion dollars. So right now, you know, we're at half a trillion dollars per year cost in the United States alone for one single disease, okay? And it gives you a sense. And this is going to uh, double at least by the year 2050. So this is something that really needs a lot of attention. All right, so um, you, you guys know who that is? Okay, Breaking Bad, Walter White. So I love this, okay? 
the uh, as a chemist, okay, the most to be blunt, the most badass guy to ever be on TV as a chemist. Okay? <laughs> Who would have thought? All right. So uh, I, I love Breaking Bad. I thought it was hysterical. Uh, but anyhow, I want to show you a little bit of how we represent molecules, and it'll give you a sense. So I can describe just a little bit about the prion protein. So you probably, uh, for those of you that are science heads, you know, you probably recognize what's going up, going on up here for those of you that are not. You probably have this gut sense that, oh, all of these things are molecules. That looks like a molecule, that looks like a molecule, et cetera. But they're all very different representations. And chemists are really good at this. Chemists are great at coming up with very compact representations that carry just the information that you need for the issue that you want to study. So what are you guys looking at here? So this up here, this here on the right, of course, that's the double helix of DNA. Anybody recognize the molecule in the upper left? Caffeine. Okay. So that one, and that one, two of my favorites, that's ethyl alcohol. Okay, wine. Um, this is a hormone. Okay, this is a hormone that suppresses feeding. Um, that's an amino acid, etc. Okay, and so all of these look really different. Some you have letters, some you have subscripts, some you have lines and you know and circles and stuff like that. But they're all different ways of representing molecules. And I put this up here because I want to talk a little bit about proteins and give you a sense of how we represent uh, uh, proteins when we are discussing with each other. So proteins are, as I was saying before, made up of amino acids. Humans have typically 20 different types of amino acids, and you can make this whole menagerie of thousands of different proteins by putting in different numbers of amino acids, different order of the amino acids, et cetera, et cetera. And if you've ever been to a health food store and you look on the shelf, you go to the amino acid section, you see lysine and tryptophan and stuff like that. So those are all amino acids, okay? Um, the fact that you are listening to me right now, you're firing your glutamate receptors in the brain are firing glutamates and amino acid. So you string them together and you get proteins. The problem is, once you have, I don't know, you know, 200 amino acids like that, and you put it all together into the molecular shape that we know it has, it looks like a big ball of mush, okay? There's no way to see what's actually going on in that particular structure. So you think, okay, well, let's be a little bit more clever. Instead of representing every atom in there, oh, by the way, do you guys have a sense of how big a protein is, how big a molecule is? Okay, so here's, the, here's what I do with school kids. We can all do this together. Um, if you take your fingers, okay, and make the smallest little peephole that you can, just barely let light through, okay? So that's really, really small, right? That's about a million times larger than a molecule, okay? So that gives you a sense of how small molecules are. Nevertheless, okay, here you have all the atoms in this molecule clumped up like this. You have no sense of what it's telling you. So you think, all right, let's be a little bit clever here, and let's uh, get, a get rid of all the balls, and we'll turn it into sticks. Okay, we'll put sticks between the atoms and clear it up a little bit. How big is and that? That's, that part right there is about 120 amino acids. Like how many micrometers? Oh, uh, it, is, um, it is about uh, 10 to 15 angstroms across. So you do it in sticks, and it looks a little bit better, but it's still not great, okay? And then what you realize is what really matters is not the specific amino acid at every point, but how all the amino acids connect to each other. So then what you do is you draw a line, okay, connecting all the amino acids, and you get that, okay? Now that's clear, isn't it? Okay, and that is the prion protein. And that's the protein that aggregates in those CJD plaques and the Kuru plaques and the bad cow plaques, et cetera, okay? It's that guy right there. Now, this is the normal healthy form. So just so we're all clear, we all have this protein, okay? This is a normal constituent of the central nervous system. And in fact, it's found throughout the body, not just the central nervous system. Uh, it's found at high levels in the brain. It's found in gland tissue. As a matter of fact, tonsil biopsies in the United Kingdom are used to, to determine whether people have been exposed to mad cow tissue. Uh, found in muscle tissue and so forth. But that's the prion protein. So you're seeing just the what's called the, the secondary and tertiary structure in terms of how it, it packs together. Yeah, Dave. Is there a no, known function for prion? Uh, I'll get to that a little bit okay. later, but that's a, that's a good question. Okay, and as a matter of fact, that's coming up. Yeah. What's the difference between the wire and the ribbon? Yeah, so what you're seeing here is there's two very standard types of secondary, so-called secondary structure. One is called an alpha helix, and whenever there's an alpha helix, it's represented by more of a flat ribbon like that, and you see this corkscrew, this right-handed corkscrew, where you can't assign structure, and that's lots of regions. We leave it as just, looks like, looks like a wire right there. The other standard form, but it shows up just very uh, limited here, is if you can see, pardon me, that little arrow right there, that little arrow right there, those are called beta strands. Okay, so helices and strands are really, really common. Can you 
have both um, helices, both left and right handed, or only no, one of you? No, no, just right handed. Just right handed. Just right handed. And perchance. But there's a great story about that because the discoverer, the person who the person who first proposed the structure of the alpha helix was Linus Pauling. And when he published the paper, they did it backwards, and he published a left-handed alpha helix. Mm -hmm. But what we have are right-handed alpha helices, and that's because of what's called the stereochemistry of the individual amino acids. So can there be a disease when you get the wrong um, chirality? No, not the wrong chirality, but the, but the <coughs> wrong fold. Okay, so what happens is this whole thing unstructures and restructures into a different form, and that's the form that actually aggregates. Yeah. Yeah. So when, say, a muscle like spasms or flexes, mm -hmm. would those be connecting together rapidly? No, that's a whole different process. Okay. okay, what you have there is what's called actin and myosin, and you have ATP that's providing energy, and you literally have proteins that are sweeping along other proteins that are causing that. That has probably nothing to do with the prion protein itself. Prion protein, probably in terms of its function, has more of a developmental role. Oh, cool. Okay. So this is just showing you a menagerie of different proteins. They come in all different sizes and shapes. And this is now highlighting what you were asking about the helical structure. So there's the individual amino acids. You can bunch it up into a helix, strands, uh, good old hemoglobin right there. This is moving oxygen throughout our bodies. Um, we have all these other guys. What's this bacteria rhodopsin? So that's a, that's a proton pumping uh, um, protein that's found in, in certain <coughs> bacteria and so forth. So these all carry out different functions, but just gives you a sense of the menagerie of what's going on. All right, so now, how can a protein, all right, so we have a protein-based disease, infectious, you know, the, the infectious component is coming from the protein. How do you have a protein that causes an infectious disease? So um, we think of the prion protein, this touches on what you were asking about, as having two different shapes. A cellular shape, the shape that we all have, okay, the healthy form, and then you have a different form called PRPSC. So PRPC is prion cellular, PRPSC is PRP scraping. And so even though scrapie is just one of the diseases, that's what everybody in the field calls it. It's the scrapie form of the protein. So um, you have a good protein, you have a, a good fold for the protein and a misfolded version of the protein. Now what I'm going to show you is the, the stupidest excuse for a, I, I wouldn't even call it a video, but, but of a demonstration you will ever see, but I think it makes a point. So one of my postdocs made this many, many years ago, and somehow it just works, okay? So chemists, uh, we, we're very reductionist, so this is our view of a biological cell, okay? It's just a circle, okay? And the prion protein is actually decorates the outside of cells, all right? And on neurons, as I was saying before, it's, it's found in fairly high density. So here you have this cell that has all these prion proteins on the outside. And then along comes a misfolded version of the protein. Okay, it's floating up and it meets the cell, and now it contacts one of the healthy forms. By a mechanism that we don't understand, okay, somehow the, the unhealthy form convinces the healthy form to change shape. Okay, so now you have two copies of the protein. So now you've got two copies that can interact with other versions of the protein, and now you have four copies, right? And in chemistry, this is called autocatalysis, okay? And this is kind of a runaway chemical reaction, which uh, admittedly is gonna be a vast oversimplification compared to what's really going on. But the idea is, is that the unhealthy form templates the healthy form. The healthy form, as one says, is a substrate for the unhealthy form. When the unhealthy form comes in contact with the healthy form, if there's an abundance of it, it will convert all of that material over. And eventually you get more and more and more and more it makes the point, doesn't it? Right? It's pretty effective, okay? And then the cell's dead. You can tell because the membrane can come apart. Okay. So, so um, yeah. The prion pro protein doesn't actually replicate itself. It that does not. That's that was right. The initial thought. Yeah, right? yeah, that's, that's right. That's right. It does not replicate itself. What it does, as a matter of fact, if you take scraping material, if you have an animal that's a knockout, so it doesn't have its own endogenous prion protein, and you inject, inject scraping material, they don't develop the disease. Okay, it absolutely has to have endogenous material to convert over. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. How does it get through to the inside of the cell? Great question. Well, it doesn't get to the inside of the cell. It acts on the outside of the cell. But, but the question I think you might be pointing towards is how does it get to the central nervous system? How do we eat it? And then it propagates up to the brain. Okay. And that's an unknown. But one of the things that, that's considered is that the gut is highly innervated. 
And so we have nerves lining the gut, okay? And we need them for peristalsis and for, for signaling and for everything else. And so uh, to the extent that one can track this, it's believed that if the scraping material, like if human eats mad cow tissue, it gets into the gut, there's these patches, they're called pyrus patches. And the mad cow tissue that comes in contact with the pyrus patches can then propagate and go up through nerves and back up to the central nervous system. Okay, very slow process, but that's, that's how it can take place. All right, so uh, what I have up here is now three different diseases I was mentioning. The TSEs, the prion diseases, propagated by the prion protein we call PRP. Alzheimer's disease is a different protein. In fact, it's really not even a protein, it's a peptide, meaning it's just a very short segment of amino acids, about 40 to 42 amino acids long. That's what kicks off the whole disease, and that guy's called A-beta, okay? Parkinson's disease, alpha-synuclein with Tony Fink, uh, used to study in great detail is called uh, you know alpha sin over there. So to me, you know, studying neurodegenerative <coughs> diseases, to me there's three really fundamental questions. Number one, of all the thousands of proteins that our bodies produce, why do these specific proteins aggregate and form these plaques, these amyloid plaques? Number two, why are the plaques, they're just us, okay, it's our own tissue, why are they toxic to brain and other tissues? And number three, and somebody was asking about this, I think Dave, you were asking, what is the function of the precursor protein? Why do we have the prion protein? Why do we have A-beta? Why do we have alpha-synuclein? So, uh, not to be dramatic here, but okay, we have no <laughs> answers, all right? Uh, some people get mad at me when I say this because there's tons of speculation out there in terms of what these different proteins do, and especially um, alpha-synuclein, okay, is thought to play a role in, uh, in ves what's called vesicle fusion and neurotransport. Yeah? I think uh, insects can technically moderate things to help those diseases. Insects? I'm not following. Because nowadays insects, I'm an entomologist, so I study mm. the, I don't self-invitimate, I just, you know, get it naturally, but it's weird how, like, a certain insect could, you know, bite you and then you're eating acid and you're, like, you know, basically dying and then, like, another one will fly in and, like, save your life, but I think, you know, they should try a, like a wilderness um, meditation thing and see if the insects can cure these things. I would be very skeptical, but, but worth thinking about. Yeah? Are there people who don't have the prion protein? Great question. So one of the things we wonder about in terms of function is if you can find a human that has a very, very defective form of the protein. Okay, what are their derangements? Um, an individual that is totally devoid of PRP has never been found. However, there's mutation called 144 stop. Okay, and those individuals lack a functional prion protein. They have a, um, a version of protein that's about half the protein and it's totally non-functional. It's not connected to your membranes or, or, or anything. And so we've looked at some of that literature and the best that we can tell, the one systematic thing that comes through is that they suffer from depression. Okay, so whatever connection happens to be there. And are they subject to these uh, Kruzfeld, Jacob uh, Yeah, so 144 stop, they, it's, uh, they get spontaneous disease, okay? Because that protein, that half the protein they have, aggregates very aggressively, so they die young. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so is the pathology of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, are you proposing is the same replicating kind of protein? Well, it's different in terms of different regions of the brain. Uh, it's the Systamtia nigra that's grossly affected the dopaminergic neurons and Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease. You know, it's a, but it's the, the number of that it is a abnormal protein that is is sort of converting other proteins. Yes. Along yeah. It's the same that, that's right. That's so right. they're thought to be a kind of prion disease. Yeah, point. and that's that's an interesting point because it was always thought that what made prion disease is absolutely distinct is that they're the only infectious version. So in other words, with Alzheimer's disease, we're producing A-beta all the time. A-beta is a normal constituent of the cerebral spinal fluid. At some point in life, it starts to aggregate. And where those aggregates form, as more A-beta is produced, it will glom onto those aggregates. But if you take those aggregates out of a diseased brain, inject them into a healthy brain, okay, in a, in a laboratory, lab animal setting, it was thought that, oh, they don't get the disease. Therefore, those aggregates are not infectious. But more recent studies actually show that they are. Okay, and if it, in fact, both Parkinson's disease and um, uh, Alzheimer's disease plaques can propagate the disease. 
So it's often referred to not quite as a prion disease because it's not really, it's not nearly as aggressive as PRP, scrapie is. So they're often thought of as what are called prionoids. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So these proteins are on the outside of the cell. Correct. How do they kill the cell? Yeah. So uh, let me touch on that in a couple minutes. Okay. It's a good question. All right. So uh, all right. So this now gets to just a little bit. And I think this will get to what you're you're asking about. Um, this gets to our research. So it was found. Um, oh, let me see. Keep track of the time. Oh, we're good. Okay. Uh, about 20 plus years ago, that um, the prion protein is actually a copper binding protein. So, uh, you know, we tend to think of biological molecules. You have sugars, you have lipids, you have, you know, um, you have proteins, you have nucleic acids, but we can't live without our metals, okay? And we all know the story of iron and hemoglobin. You absolutely need that, okay? Olaf can tell you uh, tons about copper and oxidases, okay, for cellular metabolism, cellular respiration, okay? Uh, zinc also plays a big role for structuring proteins, so these things are absolutely critical. And in fact, one third of all proteins are actually metal binding proteins. Metal ions are absolutely critical. So PRP was found to be in this family. And so, of course, it brought up a whole bunch of different possible <coughs> functions, perhaps copper regulation, uh, signaling, and so forth. And so let's see, where are we? Yeah, so copper. So how do we think about copper? So this is how we typically, you know, the, the, most people think about copper. You've got copper wire running all through your house. If you're kind of exotic, you have a really cool looking copper bathtub over here. Uh, but that's not how a chemist thinks about copper. <coughs> this is how a chemist thinks about copper. One single atom of copper nestled in the middle of a really, really complex protein, okay? And copper is really important for, for a number of different reasons. Number one, it binds proteins very, very tightly. So when it's in a protein, it's usually there, you know, for, for some purpose and, and it helps structure the protein, number one. Number two, copper is very, very chemically reactive. And the body knows how to take advantage of that reactivity for cellular respiration and a number of other very uh, different and very, very important processes. So, um, right. So here's what we talk about instruments for a second. So uh, I just, just to show off, we're very excited in the chemistry department. This is actually right next to Olaf's lab. Do you ever go in there? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an amazing, we just installed this instrument about two years ago. It's a $3 million uh, nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometer. And this is one of the instruments. And I'm not gonna you know, bore you guys with lots of spectroscopy. But this over here is a monstrous magnet. The magnetic field it generates is about 400,000 times the Earth's magnetic field. Um, you have to be careful around it. Pardon me? How many Tesla? It is 18.8 Tesla. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of Tesla. It's a superconducting magnet, uh, meaning that it operates at cryogenic liquid helium temperatures. Um, and uh, because of those huge magnetic fields, it polarizes the nuclei of proteins that we put into the magnet and from that polarization from the chemical environment and by sending impulses from all these electronic things the computer and this console over here dot, 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 we can work out the detailed structure of the protein so that that ribbon so-called diagram that i showed you before the prion protein that was all solved on this kind of instrument okay so we're very proud of this this is probably one of the finest instruments and in, you know for this type of work in all of california and we competed with our subgroup of structural biologists at UC Santa Cruz, competed for a program at the National Institutes of Health called the High End Instrumentation Program. They give you, the max they'll give you is $2 million. They make about 25 awards per year across the entire country. And UCSC got one of them, okay? And so, thank you. My daughter keeps calling me. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we just installed that. We're, we're, it's, it's just an um, absolutely wonderful facility. All right. So now, here's a little bit of a sense of what the prion protein looks like. So I, what I showed you before was just this region over here with the three helices, all right, and the two little, little anti-parallel beta strands, little beta sheet. But in fact, there's a whole other half of the protein, and that's this part over here. And so this region, and so somebody was asking about the, the, the strand part, I think you were asking about this. This means it's disordered, okay? It doesn't really have any structure. So that's the signal to a protein chemist. We don't really know what the structure is, and it may be unstructured, maybe moving around, okay? So this is rather unstructured over here. But what we know is that copper binds right within that region right there. So over the last, and it may seem insane how long this has taken, but over the last 20 years, we've mapped out all the details of how it interacts with copper. We know the so-called redox properties. We know the affinity, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, we know all about this stuff. Now, 
one of the things you notice is the labels on top, all right? So over here, this is called the toxic region of the protein. And this has come about from a series of experiments just over the last five years, some from our lab, some from, lab, from labs um, in Europe, uh, another lab we collaborate with at Boston University, that has shown all by itself that the prion protein can generate very, very potent toxicity in a cell or even in an animal. Okay? And it may be responsible for that, that, that phenotype, that behavior that I was showing you in one of the very first slides, that little video of the animal that was, had the profound neurodegeneration. That animal actually did not have any plaques whatsoever. It just had a modified version of the prion protein. Okay? So that toxicity is completely eliminated if you cut off this region of the protein. On the other hand, this region of the protein regulates this region of the protein. <coughs> And so we now think that prion toxicity goes through two different stages. One is that the early stage is that this region over here loses contact with this region or loses regulatory pressure over this region. And then later, this, the, the protein itself starts to aggregate and causes other problems that develop as well. Okay? So what we found um, over the last three, four, five years, we've now published a series of papers on this, is when it was proposed, that the C-terminal domain regulates the toxic N-terminal domain, there is no sense of the, what the molecular contacts were. We feel that we have now determined what those contacts are. Using that instrument that I showed you before, there, it's kind of a, actually, a visiting graduate student mentioned this. It, it's, a, it's like such a great analogy. You know those little um, toys you have as a, as a kid, it's a cup and a little ball on the string, okay? I, I could never get the ball in the cup, ever, okay? But it's the same kind of thing. You flip it around and the ball lands in the cup, right? So this is the cup, the orange part is the cup, and you can't quite tell from this image, but there's kind of a little divot right there, and this is the ball on the string. And when that pops in there, that regulates the protein, and that keeps the protein in its healthy form, okay, in its non-toxic form. Hmm. The region that's deleted in those animals that were developed, that developed the disease very, very early as neonates, that region is this right here in blue, okay? And what we have now shown, we just published this last year, that if you eliminate this region, this ball into the cup no longer takes place. And this region of the protein is left unregulated, and that's what produces the toxicity. So we, you know, we do the structural work, but structure by itself always has to be placed in the context of physiological experiments. And so we have a wonderful collaborator at Boston University, and they, have, uh, they do electrophysiology, and so we can test these hypotheses directly in um, uh, immortal cells, cancer cells, we can test them in, in uh, neurons and so forth, and it's a hypothesis that seems to be holding up very well. So this is what we're working on right now. We're really, really excited, you know, if we indeed have found this regulatory region and the mechanism. And so now what we're doing is trying to understand, so we kind of know the contact, but we know very little about the atomic detail of what's going on between these two regions of the protein. And this is uh, something that we're working on right now. What did the so, numbers mean in the prior uh, the prior one on the bad toxicity it says 90 59 23 yeah so so what we do is when you're um, looking so who asked the question I, oh there you are okay so I'm, when I teach intro chem I get, get a question out of 300 people and I can never see who it is so I have to point out so I can talk to the person that's how we number the amino acids all right so when you have a protein let's say of 200 amino acids what you do is you look at the so-called end terminus. Okay, that's the beginning. That's amino acid one, two, three, four, five. And so you know exactly. So this way, if I talk to another, another protein chemist and I can say, hey, we mutated, you know, Q144 or something like that, they know exactly where in the protein that was done. And you may wonder, wait a second, why is this guy starting at 23? Okay, and that's because proteins have the beginning part. It's called a signal. Okay, and that tells the body where to put the protein. Some proteins need to be inside of a cell, some proteins need to be outside of a cell, and so forth. So you have little signals there, and then once the protein gets to where it needs to be, that part's cut off. Okay? So PRP goes from 20 to uh, what, 229, 230, over there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So that's the hopefully healthy form of the protein. So now, if we compare um, neurodegenerative diseases to other diseases, and the major ones that I think of uh, are, of course, cancer. Uh, cardiovascular disease and metabolic diseases and with all of these as horrible as they all are at least in many many cases there are treatments okay with, with cancer of course there's sometimes chemotherapy can work sometimes radiation therapy can work um, interestingly I don't know if you guys are aware of this the most successful 
reduction of cancer has come from one thing in our society. It has nothing to do with medication. It's cessation of smoking. Okay. So for all the billions and billions of dollars, and it's, it's worthwhile research, of course, but for all the billions of dollars, nothing has saved more lives from cancer than the fact that we don't smoke as, well, as much as we used to. Is that both marijuana and cigarettes? Oh, I have no idea. Oh, no. <laughs> cigarettes, I mean, cigarettes is the biggie. They both have to toxic. Yeah, you know, I would, you know, I'm, I'm no expert on, on pot smoke, yeah. Wood smoke? Wood smoke? Well, I don't, you know, Wood it's smoke? really cigarette smoke. That's that's the big issue, because this is where people are like, directly drawing it into their lungs, you know, and repeatedly throughout the day. Automobile exhaust? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, of course, we have cardiovascular disease, but now we have to have diets, we exercise more, and of course, there's there's treatments, there's blood pressure treatments and all sorts of stuff, metabolic diseases, diabetes, and so forth. We've had insulin for years. Uh, for neurodegenerative disease, there's nothing, okay? There's really nothing out there. It's a whole different paradigm, and, uh, and this gives you a sense of how complicated this is. So, what I showed you before, of course, is that we're talking about protein aggregation. Well, this is known in much, much finer detail than just like protein by itself, protein aggregated. There's all these different steps, and this is how a chemist thinks of it. So you have, and this is just an example from, from one protein, but you have, you know, so-called monomeric proteins, the normal isolated version of the protein over here, forms these little aggregates. These little aggregates form these little so-called amyloid seeds, okay? They form single filament fibers. The single filament fibers form the double filament, or even triple filament fibers. Where do you treat this? Okay, what do you do? What do you do to halt this process? It's really unclear. Okay, and a matter of fact, one of these strategies has been to reduce the amount of this. Let's see if we can come up with some sort of molecule, a medication, okay, that halts the formation of this. And you think, ah, if we can do that, we'll keep these fibers from forming, and maybe that will stop Alzheimer's disease, until the field realized that these are much less toxic than those. Okay, so you stop that from forming, you increase the population of that stuff, and it's actually more cytotoxic. So this gives you a sense of how complicated these diseases are. It's just really no clear place where to jump in and stop this. And in fact, the one, uh, well, there's several different medications out there now, but this is Aricept. You may have heard about this. For some reason, it was, getting, it was on TV all the time for a while, and then it stopped. Uh, maybe they're selling enough of it. But Aricept is a cholinesterase inhibitor. So it's really not acting on the aggregates at all. Um, acetylcholine is a standard neurotransmitter. Cholinesterase breaks down acetylcholine after it's done its signaling job. And so by having an inhibitor, you keep col acetylcholine rather, in the synapse, the region between two neurons a little bit longer, and that seems to reduce symptoms. And it will um, prolong cognitive function for some, something like three to six months. Okay. So anyhow, so that's that's where we are, okay? Now, of course, there's lots of subtleties and there's lots of great things going on, but, but, but it is a vexing problem, and, and hence why there's really no uh, good medications, yeah. Are these admiral proteins such that a monoclonal antibody can attack? That, that is exactly what a number of companies are trying, and it's been very spotty in terms of the success. So what a monoclonal antibody does, and it's a, it's a great question, this is a, uh, a, a very large protein that will grab on with very high specificity to whatever it's been grown up against, whatever its target is. And so it's been thought that if you have monoclonals against A-beta, perhaps it'll reduce the A-beta load. Uh, first of all, you have to get them across the blood-brain barrier, which is non-trivial. But they figured out ways to, number one, humanize them, and number two, make them go in through a transport mechanism. So that, that issue has been overcome to some degree. But then they get in there, and it really has not had much effect on people that are showing the beginning symptoms. So one thought is that uh, we're attacking this way too late in terms of the progression of the disease. Perhaps uh, an, an antibody, a relevant antibody that does the job, if, it's, if individuals who show up to genetic predisposition, for instance, to Alzheimer's disease, are treated years, a decade before they're symptomatic, perhaps it will give them a longer life before they lose cognitive function. And, and have they ever found any kind of chemical thing that blocks that replication piece? Not, nothing that would work in the body. Yeah, I mean, you can do all kinds of things in the lab. Like we can treat it with guanidine. It's toxic, but man, it breaks up the, the aggregates like crazy. But nothing that will really work, uh, work in the body at this point. All right, so uh, let, me, let me just say a couple things. Yeah. Oh, uh, you probably saw the recent article about gum disease and bacteria. 
I did. And, uh, yeah. So yeah. I wonder yeah. how that relates to what you said before about bacteria just sort of being a conduit. For yeah. So, maybe so making right, this uh, right. go up. So my understanding of that work is it's actually not the bacteria. It's it's a certain protein that's released from gum disease, and because of the proximity, that gets into the, in the central nervous system, and somehow that facilitates uh, you know the development of Alzheimer's disease. But I think that's more of a of a correlation than it really is a um, a direct causative link at this point. But it's definitely an in interesting observation. But yeah. it's food, it's diet. <laughs> Alzheimer's disease? Yes. I don't think so. Absolutely. Well, okay. I mean, look, you know, if you've got a diet that you think, well, great, then you might be right, okay? But I, I don't believe there's been any definitive studies that have made that connection. They won't admit it. It's a big money. Yeah, you know. Um, well, Olaf and Dave can, can comment on this as well, you know. Scientists that are working in the laboratory, you know, we're not, well, companies aren't controlling us, okay? We're really trying to discover what's going on at a molecular basis and to try to provide insight into disease. And this this deep skepticism that somehow pharmaceutical companies are controlling all of us and controlling the release of information, it doesn't work for me. They own the hospitals. Dignity Health owns the drug companies. Okay. Yeah. Uh, speaking of this though, I mean, you're speaking very fast and I'm trying to absorb all of it, but at one point you said, you know, something about people who have genetic predispositions, mm -hmm. if we started earlier. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously people have different reasons for coming here, but I both of my parents died of dementia, and that's scary, okay? And um, how do, is there any research on, I mean, I, I, I came in a little late, but is there any research on, on like, genetic, what, what is a genetic predisposition? How do you, what do you look for? What, what genes do you look for? What proteins do you look so, for? So what I would recommend, I'm, I'm not the expert to speak on that, but you should go in for genetic counseling, okay? I mean, those those types of things are available. There's a number but there of is, genetic... There is, a, there is, there are, it is already established. Oh, right? most definitely. There's a, there's a number of, okay. yeah, there's a number of different proteins, so there can be mutations. Pardon me, in A-beta, those are fairly rare, mm -hmm. but there's other proteins that play a role. Um, apolipoprotein E, okay, the specific form of that that you have can predispose individuals, okay. There can also be certain environmental factors that play a role, especially actually in Parkinson's disease. Uh, that, that neurodegenerative disease is more closely re related to environment. Um, metal ion exposure, uh, manganese, you know, and so forth has caused hot spots of Parkinson's mm -hmm. disease around the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? What was the aluminum fear about? Yeah. The, there was a whole yeah. thing going on where you can't Right, right. Aluminum, that, 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 came in, that came and went. Yeah, yeah. 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 That never really <laughs> held up. Yeah. It yeah. Just came out People still talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, Glenn, you talked about at the very beginning about these different mice. Mm -hmm. uh, that you could have it and or totally eliminated and yeah. you were fine and you had to have that specific mutation. So, if we look at the Alzheimer uh, disease and you have uh, a different protein. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have to? Ha I mean, I know that there's a mutation in it and it ca causes something. Mm -hmm. But if you totally remove it, oh, remove a beta. Yeah. The problem is, would love to. Okay. So all this point here is, if there's a way of eliminating a beta as Just a peptide, totally. you would eliminate the disease. The problem is, a beta is a breakdown product of what's called APP. And APP is the amyloid precursor protein, and it's a large multi-domain protein that's very f important for neurological function. Okay. okay? And so uh, the view of many, and I think I share this as well, is that A-beta probably by itself doesn't have any function. It's just proteolytic junk, you know, that's just a result of the processing of APP. Yeah. But, but didn't you tell us that there was a knockout mouse that uh, lacked that protein completely and presumably healthy? Um, there's a knockout. I was talking about PRP. Um, oh, PRP. Yeah, I PRP. About the yeah. Yeah. And, and laboratory animals, they actually have the opposite problem. It's really hard to develop an, uh, an Alzheimer's model in a mouse or a rat. Mm -hmm. And so what has been done in more recent years is they've replaced the a APP with a human APP, and they now start developing the same uh, mm -hmm. disease progression. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, let me finish up here real quickly. And so, uh, do, I, do I still have a couple of minutes? Yeah, we good? Okay, this won't take long. So I just want to touch on more of the, you know, what, what makes a lab work, how do we pay for it, and who does it? And so most of the work, for instance, our department 
uh, chemistry department at UCSC, most of our money comes from the National Institutes of Health. And this is a, 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 an institute, it's plural, okay? This is in Bethesda, Maryland, very, very close to Washington, D.C. Uh, most of the work that is done out at universities comes from individual grants. So we apply to the NIH. They have all these different, you get, you get familiar with this, you know, this jumble of letters over here, National Institute on Aging, National Cancer Institute, Allergy and Infectious Disease, General Medical Sciences, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, a lot of their money is kept inside, and it's actually kind of like a campus, a university, where they do their own research, and that's called intramural. And then we, like Olaf has, you know, uh, uh, had many NIH grants, my lab's had NIH grants, Dave as well, uh, we're the extramural people. We're the people that apply for grants, and if we're fortunate, the grants come out uh, to our, our <coughs> different laboratories. So let's put this in perspective, all right? So here's a quick snapshot of the national budget. So we're at about uh, 3.5 trillion. This is a couple years old, okay? And you can see what's going on. You can see where we're gonna end up over here, okay? So we have uh, social security, okay? We have defense, you know, between 500 billion and a trillion dollars, <coughs> Medicare, Homeland Security. So let me fill in, okay, what's going on with the NIH. So this is most of the health research across the country, okay? And this is most of the basic research across the country. Materials, energy research, you know, things like that. Just curiosity about how molecules and stuff work. And ready? You have to look carefully. There they are. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> so 36 billion, and actually this year is a banner year for the NIH. Um, somehow Congress got their head on straight for once, and they actually increased the NIH budget. So this is what's been going on for the, you know, with the NIH for, for years now. So you can see the different presidential uh, administrations, Clinton, Bush, Obama, and now Trump. Uh, when Trump first came into office, he wanted to cut the NIH budget by a third, okay? Uh, if, if you can believe the, the sanity build of the that. <laughs> Pardon me? Build the wall. Yeah, build the wall, yeah, there you go. Uh, so interestingly, you notice the increase over here. Okay, so this was back when the uh, George H. W. Bush, okay, was mu as a president was much more enlightened than we, what we currently see, and he proposed along with Congress a doubling of the NIH budget. People were really suffering trying to get grants, and he says, you know, this is crazy. We spent so little of the budget on this. Let's double the budget, but you can't do it all at once because then you just you're not spending the money efficiently. So they went on a program of doubling the budget, and that continued through the Clinton years, okay, and continued just in the beginning of the G.W. Bush administration, and then it stopped. And then they never increased it again. So then it started coming down. And the problem with, with research is we all know the standard inflation rate, CPI, something like 3%. Well, research is expensive, and the instruments get more expensive. And so the inflation rate is substantially greater than the CPI. It's probably about 6%. So if we're staying the same, we're losing 6% of our buying power every year. If we're coming down, it becomes devastating. And as we got into these years, that's the stimulus package. Obama kicked in an extra $10 billion, spread out over two years. But our <laughs> buying power went down and down and down. And these were desperate times. Very, very tough to stay funded through this period. And keep in mind that what you're seeing here is the bar that's all the funding, okay? But 90% of each bar goes to existing grants. Okay, if you get a five-year grant, okay, your, your, your out years, your two, your three, your four, that's coming out of the 90%. So new grants have to come out of the top 10%. And this part, the 90% can't be reduced. So as this comes down, that top, you know, that 10% that for new grants, that part gets squeezed disproportionately to everything else. And so it became, became very, very difficult. Fortunately, we're now like slightly trending up, but we're still way below our max. And this is all in constant dollars, I should mention. So the other thing I want to mention is who does the work. <coughs> so, you know, we have this, uh, so I'm a gray-haired guy, you know, and you know, you think uh, the people that work in laboratories. Well, minutes. If you need a library card, please go to service desk now. <laughs> the restroom will be locked 10 minutes before closing. If you need to print or make copies, please do so now. La biblioteca cerrará en 20 minutos. You warned me about the message, but you didn't say it was this long. Yeah. But this is Japanese. Did you ever find it? No, it's the little night. Yeah. Steve Hawkins invented that probe light parachute lane. I have no idea. Because they were talking about that years ago. I was like, man, that'd be sweet. So, all right. Can I talk now? Yes, you can. So, um, so the question is, who does the research? And of course, we, you know, the, the general public has this idea that it's a whole bunch of 
incredibly nerdy people working in isolation in a laboratory and I don't want to see real life and stuff like that. You don't look nerdy. So, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the nicest thing I've heard all day. Okay, so this is what the researchers really look like. Okay, they're a bunch of kids. Okay, awesome. yeah, yeah. They're all like in their 20s. Aren't they amazing? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So this was, so we're foodies in my laboratory. We like to go out for lunch. And so this is at facilities. And uh, yeah, they're just a bunch of people, you know, mostly graduate students working on their PhDs, but a handful of undergraduates. Uh, and uh, it's just amazing how sharp they are and how, how quick a study they are when they come into the laboratory. And they become very sophisticated researchers in, you know, in a couple of years. And then they want to graduate. It's really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is just a couple of pics from my lab. Um, so the fellow on the upper left is uh, Rafael Palomino. Uh, he's now Dr. Palomino, and he actually transitioned into education. He's now one of the directors of what's called the IC program up at UCSC. So this is the Institute for Science en and Engineering Education, and he's very involved, very in engaged in, in education. Um, Graham and Valerie right there are both graduate students. They're very, getting very, very close to, uh, to finishing their degrees. Um, Ashley in the upper right, she is now off in a PhD program at UC San Diego. And this young lady, Julia, um, applied to graduate schools all across, actually across the country. She's getting in everywhere without interview. She's already been admitted to Berkeley, San Diego, UCLA. So she's going to be a little rock star. You know, very, very proud of these kids. All right, so that's the one in the back. Oh, that one right there? Yeah. That's Kate. <laughs> Kate was having a bad day. <laughs> but she got her PhD. She's wow. gone. Yeah, yeah. She, she's now done. Anyhow, so uh, that's the current team, and uh, uh, I really appreciate your attention. Thank you. Where's Alex? What mountain is that? I don't know. But Alex is a, is a climber. It always makes me nervous because he does serious climbs, you know. So we'll go when we he's now left the laboratory, but when, when we go to conferences, especially if it's in a, like a resort area in the Colorado Rockies or something, he would always take an afternoon and go climbing, and it always made me nervous. Yeah, if you're doing basic science research. Right. Um, do you work with others on translations of that, or how do you work? With we would like to, you know. Uh, so the question is, do we do translational research? Is where, where you take the basic discoveries and turn them into therapeutics, you know, uh, therapies and so forth. And we're really not quite at that point yet, but there's a number of things that we'd like to do. So with our collaborators, especially the ones at Boston University, they're much closer to that. And they do think about, different, you know, they have a system when they're looking at neurons of dosing it with different drugs, different organic molecules to see if we can inhibit some of these interactions that we see. So there's kind of a translational component there. We also think about, now that we've discovered this, this important contact within the prion protein, there's a, uh, uh, a center, the so-called chemical screening center at UCSC, where we can now, if we have a way of reading out, we're going to have to develop this, but we can screen that for different uh, organic molecules, different drugs, and see if some of those will stabilize the protein. But that's about as close as we get. The, the NIH was really pushing translational stuff. Right? But they still are. They yeah. still are. They still are, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Have you answered my question about how these external proteins damage the inside of the cell? I did not directly. Okay, so what that is, what you're asking about in some sense, is what is this region of the protein doing to create that toxic signal? And we only have hypotheses at this point. Okay, so there's a couple of different things that, that may be going on. Number one, uh, is that this region, and actually Dave would be an expert on this, this region has a lot of positive charge, and it's thought that it may interact directly with membranes and cause the membranes to become leaky. Okay, so that's one hypothesis. Another hypothesis that's really interesting, and this came out of the Zurich lab that I mentioned before, is that this region of the protein actually acts as a signaling component for, for receptors on what are called Schwann cells that develop myelin and nerves. And so one of the things that's been noticed in prion deficient laboratory animals <coughs> is that their large nerves, their sciatic nerves and other large nerves, don't have the same level of development as wild type animals. In particular, what's missing is this fatty substance <coughs> that goes around the outside of the nerve that makes the signal propagate rapidly. And it's called myelin. That fatty material is called, called myelin. 
And so there are certain receptors, the Schwann cells develop the myelin, and so uh, uh, it's thought that, that perhaps what's going on here is that this region, through development of the neurons, this region is contacting those receptors on the Schwann cells, accelerating myelin development, and perhaps a breakdown there. There's a number of other receptors that are implicated. There's a whole menagerie. There's what's called the NMDA receptor. There's uh, another one called the AMPA receptor. These are so-called glutamate uh, receptors that are very important for um, uh, neuron function, especially in the brain. And so PRP, it's kind of transitioned from, we don't know what it does. Now we have a lot of things that it does. We don't know what it really does, you know what I mean? <laughs> but in terms of its toxic signaling, it seems to be related to this. And I, I would say in the most general sense, either punching holes in membranes or causing aberrant signaling. Okay. Yeah. What is the first step of these prion diseases? The first well, thing that happens. The first thing, it all depends on which form. If you're talking about sporadic, um, you know, an unfortunate event, somehow the proteins in some region of the brain just start to clump together, okay? And that clumping, you know, begins that autocatalytic process where more comes along. If it's, uh, if it's infectious, if it's mad cow tissue, then the clumps start in the gut, okay? And make their way to the brain. Um, you know, if it's from a corneal transplant, okay? So what happens there is if corneas are harvested from cadavers, okay? but it was unknown that those the individuals that died had CJD, those corneas are put into healthy individuals in a transplant procedure that's called the atrogenic, okay? Those individuals die, what, like six months or something like that. They die very, very rapidly. So th it, there's no single answer to that, but it always starts with something in the, in the misfolded form that, that, that as far as the infectious route goes. My husband used to do that. He was a mortician at Davis Memorial Chapel. Really? Yeah. To take the, oh, Corneas, yeah, yeah. So now one has to be very, very careful. Yeah. Uh, he's deceased two years. Yeah. Cancer. Oh, cancer. Sorry. I told him not to eat pigs. Yeah. What, yeah, Dave? What causes the pre-operation? Misfold. Um, you know, any, so the question is what causes the prion protein to misfold? Any protein can misfold. The, the, the stabilization energy of proteins is actually very, very low, and there's a reason for that. Okay? Because most proteins, we don't want them around forever. Cells are constantly turned over. The contents of cells are constantly turned over. You need a protein. So first of all, you know, the sad news is for all of us, especially with gray hair, well, you know, we weren't designed to live past 30, 35 years of age, right? Okay? So, uh, you know, the fact that proteins misfold and cause diseases, that's really a 20th century kind of phenomenon for the, for the most part. Uh, but but, but pr any protein can misfold. I oversimplified to some extent by emphasizing alpha synuclein, A beta, PRP, Huntington, okay? But actually there's a number of different so-called amyloidoses where different proteins, there are proteins in the kidneys that can misfold and cause the formation of fibrils and kidney misfunction. There's uh, cardiac disease where you can have amyloids of the, card of the heart, uh, you know, tissue as well. And so there's lots and lots of proteins that can misfold. And, and, and the short answer is the body only needs a protein to be stable enough to carry out its function for as long as you need it, but then we need to be able to get rid of that protein very quickly through the pr proteases and so forth. If a protein is too stable, you can't get rid of it. And there's only a handful of proteins in the body that we keep throughout our lives. Some of them, for instance, are in the islands. Okay, those don't turn over. Okay, the so-called crystal ones. So is it just the thermodynamic fluctuation that mm -hmm. causes That's exactly right, thermodynamic fluctuation. So it's not the proteins are very dynamic. They're moving all the time. But it's yeah. not a change in the actual structure of the protein. Not it's loss. not a change in the primary structure. It's not a loss of amino acids. It's not a loss of amino acid. It's, it's okay. in terms of sporadic disease where there's no genetic component. It's not, a, it's not a matter that the protein is changing an amino acid. It's usually just that the thermodynamic fluctuations, the motions, allow it to make an excursion over to a misfolded form and somehow, through random chance, you get enough of that to where it kicks off and initiates the disease. But okay. the first knockout is you had removed some amino acids and then created the disease. Those but again, that's that's a different, that's the toxic signaling, okay, that's where, so this is where you have, you know, again, one has to separate the two different, uh, you know, aspects of it. There's the short, high potency toxicity that can come about from just an individual prion protein that isn't, doesn't have the right structure. The longer form that comes about from the aggregated form of the prion protein, okay, that, that, in, it gets a little complicated, but that will that will generate the disease and lots and lots of aggregates. The question is, what are those aggregates doing? And 
those aggregates are contacting the healthy form of the protein, they not only cause it to misfold, but they also, we believe, separate those two domains and create that toxic signaling. So by looking at the toxic signaling in isolation, as we're doing right now, we're short-circuiting okay, all of the aggregation process and getting right to the, in a sense, the nub of what, what the toxic signal is. So if it's a thermodynamic fluctuation, why doesn't it just fold back to the normal state? So it must be much more stable. So, so the question is, why doesn't it fold back to the normal? 99.999% of the time it does. How do we know that? Well, you know, I, I can't tell you how many nines are out there, but, but you know, it's, it's a matter of, as I was saying before, all proteins are very dynamic, okay? And if you look at them statistically, the likelihood of, the, you know, it's kind of like, what's the likelihood of all the gas molecules in this room will end up in one corner? Very, very low, okay? But there are thermodynamic fluctuations. So a protein will undergo normal thermodynamic fluctuations through most of our lives, throughout our bodies. Those fluctuations are within the normal scope of things. But there can be a random chance where a protein makes an excursion through a thermal fluctuation and takes it over to a form that won't fold back. Okay. Now, this probably happens with lots of proteins on a more um, consistent, I'm not thinking of quite, quite the right word, but more regular basis than we may realize, but the body has ways of protecting itself because we break down proteins. We have, we have proteases, we have what's called a proteasome, which is this little can inside of cells that, that misfolded proteins go into and get chewed up. So we have lots of protective mechanisms. So it's really a matter of, of very bad luck that a protein will get into, by a random chance, the misfolded form, and then not be subject to the normal right. degradation yeah, pathways. Yeah, the normal function. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah? What do you think of alpha fold? Think of what? Alpha fold. Alpha fold? The D mine program that's trying to calculate protein now. Geometry. Is that the one that's jobbed out to a whole bunch of different computers? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, there's, there's lots of, uh, so you're so you're asking about a specific uh, that, that one I haven't heard of, um, but there's lots of programs out there that attempt to use different algorithms to fold proteins. So you're talking about that yeah. that that yeah, genre. Uh, yeah, I mean they're great. I mean one learns a lot from them, but there's many different forms. Probably the most um, successful one right now is called Rosetta, and that was developed up, up at the University of Washington, and that actually instead of using so-called first principles in terms of how all the amino acids interact with each other, it uses as many known structures, non-redundant structures, <coughs> of, of proteins that are out there, and uses the codes from there to try to predict what, you know, how specific amino acids, specific regions of proteins will fold up. But Thank that particular you. one, I'm sorry, I'm not, not familiar with that. I, I have a feeling this, this group could go on all night. <laughs> <laughs> and you could too. Um, Unfortunately, we have to put our turn. Do you want to thank you? So, sure, yeah. very much.